Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I just say I'm glad to be back on campus and uh, seeing some faces that I know. Although I have to say I don't think about you every day. <laughs> um, I enjoyed retirement too much. <laughs> Since uh, I retired uh, just over a year ago, almost 18 months, I guess, so I've uh, been taking an interest in online courses, something I've been promising myself for a while at Bond. I know we concentrate here on face-to-face -face, uh, courses, and uh, we think we're expert in that, and I believe we are. Uh, I've always had a hankering for giving online courses, sitting in my study at home and teaching to the world. And MOOCs, of course, are, are one such way of doing it. I also, just uh, a caveat, uh, this, this, what I'm going to tell you today, is my own experience, my own personal views. I've been doing MOOCs as, as a student for over a year now. And basically, it's that experience I'm going to relate to you, as well as the trends that I think should be obvious to all. You don't only have to pick up a newspaper these days uh, and you'll eventually see an, art, an article about MOOCs uh, and how they're going to revolutionize education, how big disruption uh, is going to occur, etc. I'll give you my own view on that, which of course tends to be slightly biased towards the online education now, but uh, I hope I'll try and give you a balanced view and of course uh, open for discussion uh, at the end. The resources for this talk are the slides, and I've prepared a list of links that you might find useful uh, that relate to the slides. If you go to this uh, website where all my talks over the last few years are located and you'll find the only talk for this year is the one I'm giving today and there you'll find a link to slides and the, the links I mentioned. And I'm a firm believer now in uh, Creative Commons. Use this is completely free for you to use and reuse as long as you attribute it to me. So, I think we all know what MOOC actually stands for. Just to remind you, massive open online courses. Massive in the sense that, you know, of the order of tens of thousands of students uh, can take a course at any one time. Open in the sense that it's free uh, and open to anyone of any age, uh, more, more particularly. It's online, of course, it's available 24-7 via the internet, and it is a course. I'll be talking about courses in, in the true sense that a course has a start date and a finish date. It extends over a period of time. It's an actual event, and that if you repeat the course, it's, you know, it's a separate event. It's, it's, it's a new repeat. At the moment, the MOOCs, of course, that I think have gained uh, public uh, notice because they've been given by elite institutions and elite teachers from those institutions, although not exclusively. Uh, and so they've gained the headlines. And, of course, it's not always the case that if you're at a high-profile elite institution, you're necessarily a good teacher. And I think we're starting to see the fallout from that. This is the first recorded uh, use of the word MOOC, and of course it comes out of Canada from Dave Cormier, and a group of like-minded individuals from Canadian institutions. And this was Dave Cormier's vision. He gave effectively the first MOOC, looking back in history. He said it, it has some similarity to an ordinary course. Uh, as just mentioned, it has a timeline. Uh, but it carries no fees, no prerequisites other than internet access, it, just interest alone, no predefined expectations for participation and no formal accreditation. That was his view. The question is, are MOOCs still in this tradition? And I think we're starting to see an evolution out of this uh, original the series of thinking from Dave Cormier. Indeed, we've seen a bifurcation of MOOCs. That original MOOC is now referred to, and similar ones, uh, referred to as C MOOCs. Could well be, no one really knows what the C is for. It could be from Cormier, the, the guy who invented it. But I think it's more likely from the concept, the pedagogy of creation. Um, 
great is connectivism, uh, which is espoused by these Canadians and uh, you know, Siemens and Downs are another ma major figures in, in this movement. The idea of their type of MOOC is that effectively the participants create the content as they, as they go along. They may well be an outline of topics, but the actual detail in the topics, the, the, the detailed content is created by the participants themselves and that's contributed, created uh, to the course uh, a variety of technologies are used to gather up this content and make it available to all. It's primarily social networking of one sort or another. And you can think of these types of courses as creating knowledge as they go, or, or rather reassembling it typically. Whereas the MOOCs, I think, that have gained the headlines uh, of where all the hype is located at the moment are now referred to as X MOOCs, the first of which occurred in 2011, September 2011, the Stanford AI or Artificial Intelligence uh, Introduction, which of course gathered the 160,000 students uh, uh, to study that course. And these really are nothing more than fairly traditional um, pedagogical short courses really. A series of videos pr present the content there are a number of assessments, usually by quizzes, automatically assessed. There may be longer quizzes, longer tests, again, all automatically assessed. And really, again, it's just knowledge duplication. You're just providing knowledge to your group of participants. And it's that type of course, I think, has become to be regarded as the MOOC that everyone talks about. And it's that that I'll mention for the rest of my, my talk. So it's, it's the X MOOCs I'm talking about. Now, of course, I could have quoted hundreds of headlines. College is dead. It's the most important educational technology in 200 years. Uh, we see lots of headlines like this, lots of hype, lots of major magnificent claims for MOOCs. And of course, we have to look at it, this carefully. Uh, however, we're starting to see some uh, fairly significant articles. This is from Nature, uh, for example. And thanks to Louise, who's in the audience, for sending me a, a very important document that came out just uh, last month or in March. An avalanche is coming, which again is one of these doom and gloom uh, disruption of education type reports, but it provides quite cogent arguments for saying this and a lot of useful data, a little bit of which we'll look at later. Just on the Australian scene, we saw last September the ANU Vice-Chancellor saying, careful, MOOCs are going to have a major impact on Australian higher education, saying that we shouldn't get involved in them or we should treat them with care. And yet, lo and behold, what happens in February ANU joins one of the major consortia that I'll talk about in a moment for producing books, the edX uh, consortium. So now ANU are, are actually heavily involved, well, not heavily, but are significantly involved in producing MOOCs uh, themselves and, of course, providing them to the world. Melbourne University has signed up with one of the, the, op the opponents. We'll have a look again in a moment at that. UQ was threatening to join Coursera in as, as late ago as uh, September. As far as I know at the moment, they haven't formally signed up yet. But major Australian higher education institutions are now starting to get uh, significantly involved in this. Uh, and of course, we, we need to stand up and take notice. We really, we really must take notice of this trend and decide what, where Bond fits, how we're going to react. Uh, I say we, uh, it's mainly you uh, at this point, uh, how you are going to react to, to all of this, because I think it is a, a major evolution that's occurring. These are some of the providers that I've mentioned before. The big three are these three here, the, one of the first, and of course coming out of elite of American institutions have gained a lot of the publicity. Coursera, which I think is probably the leader in terms of the number of courses that they offer and the number of institutions that are involved with them, 
Uh, Udacity, which is the STEM MOOC I refer to as STEM I, it's, it's mainly science, technology, engineering, and mathematics based. Most of their, of their courses are in that area, whereas, of course, Coursera is now much broader. And edX, which really has grown out of MIT, but then Harvard joined it, and a few more really uh, elite institutions uh, came on board, including ANU, as I mentioned. Um, uh, th they are offering a, a small number of very high-quality courses. But then there's a whole host of others starting to appear. M most major countries are starting to get involved. Future Learn, for example, is the... UK effort based around the Open University but has 12 other major institutions involved. The Australian one which was just announced a few weeks ago, Open to Study for the support of the federal government, uh, again mainly based around the whatever it is, Open Universities Australia but with other institutions involved as well. And then uh, several private ones like the Canvas Network, Open Learning, MR University. I think that stands for Marginal Revolution University, which is a really peculiar name. Uh, but they're starting to offer MOOCs. Then there's Open Study. Stanford, uh, of course, out of which grew Coursera and Udacity, uh, uh, as a university, have uh, started to offer their venture lab but we'll see in a moment they have essentially now merged with edX. And so that's just a selection, I don't know how many there are there, about 10 of probably 50 or 100 sites stroke companies stroke institutions that are starting to offer these MOOC courses. So we, you know, we have to sit up again and take notice. This, just quickly, uh, is the list of 62 institutions currently signed up with Coursera as of last month. Notice the only uh, Australian one there is the University of Melbourne. And according to rumour in various articles that have appeared recently, if you sign up with Coursera, the, you know, they say we're only signing up the top five institutions in each geographical area, presumably in Australia. So if you're not one of the top five, you won't be able to join Coursera. Uh, looking at the American universities there, I wouldn't say they're all in the top five by any, by any means, but uh, this obviously is being applied outside of the, the US. Uh, so a lot of international universities involved in that already offering subjects, uh, courses, now, it's interesting that this is a Horizon report from the New Media Consortium who pride themselves every year of producing a report looking forward five years into the sort of technology that's going to be used in education and are likely to have a major impact in education. And they have these three bands of in the next year, in the next two to three years, and in the next four to five years. And if you look at the trend over the last half dozen years, you'll see MOOCs were not mentioned ever until this year. And it jumps in at the very top, which means significant educational technology change about to occur in the next one year. I think tablet computing we probably won't agree with. So even this, the, the people who run the Horizon Report, and they're the sort of the major educational technology people around the world, have, didn't really pick up on MOOCs until uh, just very recently. The New York Times, of course, tells us that 2012 was the year of the MOOC. And a bit like the, you know, what, Daddy, what did you do in the war? Uh, what did we do in 2012? The year of the MOOC. What did you individually do? What did we do as an institution? I don't think very much, as far as, I, as, as I'm aware. So, uh, you know, uh, what were we doing in the year of the MOOC? We would have to look back in future years and decide where, where, what, if anything, we did. So, MOOCs have come in. I just want to mention 3D printing. Do we have a 3D printer on campus anywhere? Yes. Good. 
because I think that's a, another very significant one that will, uh, I would put in the two to three year time frame, personally. And, uh, uh, it's something we, we really should be jumping into. <laughs> if nothing else, it will be useful for open day demonstrations. <laughs> now then, just last month, the Australian produced you know, the top 50 in various areas, one of which was higher education. Uh, notice, uh, the reason I put this up, Sebastian Thrun, the, the founder of Udacity, came in at number two. This is Australian higher education. He was regarded as the second most important person influencing Australian higher education. I was quite amazed when I saw this. Uh, the only one above him is the chief scientist. And there are some very significant names there, as, as you can see. The first VC is Greg Craven, which surprised me somewhat. As, uh, you know, it's down there at number nine, Australian Catholic University. I didn't realize they were such a major influence on Australian higher education, but according to the Australia, that's true. Anyone remember who the lucky 13th was? Jim Bradford. No, it was the federal treasurer, Wayne Swan. Oh. <laughs> so he came in at 13. Uh, but the, the, the point of this list is that, notice, MOOCs are up there. The, the, the person involved in MOOCs is regarded as very important. So just looking at the technological components that are typically used in MOOCs. Now, I've, I've done, as you'll see, five, I've actually completed five MOOCs, uh, and I've started about another ten and not completed them. So I've, I've had a fair bit of experience of, uh, of doing MOOCs, and these are the sorts of components, uh, pedagogical components, that, that make up some of the MOOCs I, that I've done. Primarily, a MOOC is, is focused on lots of short videos. It varies, of course, a lot from MOOC to MOOC. The most successful MOOC I, I did, the videos averaged four minutes long. The four-minute lecture. Quite different from how we go about things here at Bond. However, they did vary up to about 20 minutes, as, as, as I'll mention later. The idea is every video has at least one quiz. Again, self-assessed, uh, you know, automatically assessed. Uh, usually halfway through or maybe at the end. Then on top of that, of course, you get typical weekly activities, exercises, blog posts. You know, how do you submit your work becomes important when there are tens of thousands of students on the course. Somehow submitting centrally becomes, of course, a technological problem. And we tend to use social media type. You'll see that, of course, again, the big problem of a huge, massive course is how on earth do you mentor all your students? Well, typically you get them to mentor each other. So peer mentoring plays a, a very important role in MOOCs. And for that, forums are, are, the, are the technology of choice, but any sort of social media where, where you can share comments uh, are used as well. Also for live, you know, if, you, if you do want to reach your, your, your student body, uh, it, Typically, Google Hangouts are, 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 are the most numerous. But Blackboard Collaborate, which I notice is, is up here now, I gather. Is it being heavily used, Lauren? Uh, we're just piloting it. Yeah, piloting it. But uh, Blackboard Collaborate uh, is another favorite. Uh, I'm using that at the moment on one of the MOOCs I'm doing from the Open University in the UK. Uh, also, if, of course, from the comments, you deduce that... You know, a, an extra video basically is required. So-called office hours videos uh, are often used. So you will, you as the instructor, the presenter, will create a, an extra video responding to, choose, to student feedback yeah, on the subject. And the, normally the best you can hope for at the end of a course, of course, is either a statement of completion or a, 
you might even get a certificate of completion if you're lucky. Uh, that, that's not always the case, even, even so. So those are the, the sort of prime features that I've met in my journey. Just to have a look at some of the numbers, this is out of the Nature article. At the moment, it's claimed there are 3 million students around the world involved in doing MOOCs, and about 350 MOOCs uh, have either been offered or are being offered currently. The students are, of course, from all over the world, but notice the U.S. accounts for a quarter of them because that's where the providers typically are. But notice India's high up there, Brazil, UK, and Australia creeps in at 2.3%. The big one missing from that list, from, from my perspective, is China. I don't know whether that's because they cannot get to these MOOCs. You know, they're prevented by the great firewall. But I would have thought the Chinese would, would, would lap up this type of free online education. But according to these figures, they're, they're well down in the rest of the world. Now, as I mentioned, I was initially attracted because the early MOOCs, uh, a lot of the early MOOCs were in mass computing, information technology, uh, maths, etc., science. But as you'll see at the moment, 28% of the MOOCs are actually in the arts and humanities. So it's not just a STEM-based uh, offering. But obviously, information technology is a fairly major part, it's a quarter. Business, 13%. Science, 30%. So it's starting to spread across the whole curriculum. Now, Class Central is the place you go to find a MOOC to study. At the moment, it's sort of created itself as the, the place to find out about MOOCs. This is just a screen dump I did a couple of days ago, and you'll see uh, the sort of numbers involved here uh, of, of all the MOOCs known by Class Central. I wouldn't say they know every single MOOC that's being on, on offer, but it's, uh, you can just go to Class Central. I think it's Class hyphen Central, but it's in my list of links that you'll get later. And of course, each day the, the numbers change. Uh, so at the moment, that's the sort of central repository of, uh, of MOOCs such as it is. Now, this is something that hits the headlines a lot, especially from academic, uh, academics currently in higher education. The huge dropout rates uh, that uh, occur in, in, in MOOCs. Notice no-shows account for about 50% of the total enrollment, i.e. that people enroll in advance and then never turn up and, and, and participate. Then there are observers and the drop-ins and the passives. And then the active participants, uh, I notice, uh, <laughs> drop off by about half by the end of the course. Typical length of MOOCs, of course, well, again, they vary, but six or seven weeks is a <coughs> typical sort of length for the MOOCs that I've been doing. Is this a problem? Well, it would be, of course, in traditional higher education if you had such a, a, a low completion rate. But I don't think it really matters in terms of MOOCs. Okay, yes, you know this is going to be a behavior. You're going to know that a very small number are going to get out at the end of the, the finish of the course. Uh, but, you know, these are free courses that, from a student perspective, is, it's all they've done is invested a few hours of their time to find out that they, they can continue or they want to complete or they don't. And they can always repeat it next time this is offered. Uh, I, I don't see this as a problem in any sense because of the nature of you know, the offering. Yet it's held up as, oh, look, MOOCs are a failure because of this huge dropout rate. I, I, I don't see it that way. Now, this is, a, is quite an interesting uh, chart. This is a Katie Jordan. Here's the link to this. This is actually a, a live interactive site. She's from the OU in the UK, and this is her master's project. She, as far as she could determine, went out and found the completion rates from the different subjects. The, another thing that's come to the fore is the 
former presenters of lecturers' point of view is the need to combine not just content knowledge that we're all brilliant at, and many of us are good on the pedagogy side, the technology side is regarded as important as the other two areas. And if you want to read why and, and how you might go about combining all three, go to tpac.org and it will explain that. But this comes out in a lot of discussion. To be good at doing MOOCs, of course, you need a fair bit of technological knowledge as well as these uh, other two important teaching skills. So the, 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 the troika of skills is important. Now, I'll just quickly mention the very first one I did, the one that sticks in my mind, Udacity CS253, Web Apps Engineering. What was the last subject I taught at Bond other than the core course? Web Apps Engineering, essentially. Absolutely this identical course. And, of course, that's, that's what attracted me to it. Okay, this is how you do it as a MOOC. It was given by an absolutely brilliant teacher, Steve Huffman, not an academic, although he has worked at Stanford uh, as, a, uh, as an advisor and as a teaching assistant. He is actually an entrepreneur. You know, start, he's had several startups that he's helped create, co-founded. Uh, Reddit, you might have heard of. Reddit.com was one of his. Turns out, a wonderful teacher. He used very crude technology. This is the good old uh, Udacity electronic pen, so it's, this is like an electronic whiteboard, which you, you can write on as the instructor, and, and of course we as the audience can see it. So notice it's just like writing on, on this whiteboard here, only electronically. His was the four minutes per lecture. Notice there are quite a lot of them. This list has got about 30 in it, and it's only unit four. So 34 minute lectures, roughly. So there's a, a lot of work in, in doing this. Uh, but it was interesting to see what material he covered, what systems he used for practical work, and what topics he covered in the seven weeks. I would estimate he covered twice the number of topics I cover in my, I, I covered in my 12 week course. And surprisingly, he used the identical technology that I had chosen to teach with, the Google App Engine, it's called. It's a free service from Google. He, he, he used it uh, in exactly the same way that I did, so I was, I was pleased that I, I was well up to date in, the, in that regard. One of the nice features, and a number of the MOOCs I've done have this, it's effectively a simulator based on the web. Here, just the, this, you just type in some Python and, and it can execute. You can have a look at the results and see if you're getting it right. Uh, you, you need this type of feature. There's, uh, expecting students to go and download a piece of software and run it on their own machines is fraught with difficulty. Instead, you provide all the programming tools that are required via the web in a standard form that all students can use very easily. And, and this was excellent. The way he handled assessment as well was, of course, uh, very interesting. Uh, he got us to use this Google App Engine, and uh, this isn't, in fact, the correct address, but to, to be assessed, you had to put in the URL of your website you'd created with App Engine, and it would run through an automated script and tell you whether it was correct or not. You get a response within a few seconds as to whether this was correct or not, which is a very useful pedagogical tool because now the students get immediate feedback on whether their practical work is correct or not and where it's wrong, and you can just keep on repeating up to a certain, uh, up to a certain deadline when, of course, you have you've got them assessed at that point. Uh, I found it very useful. Now, of course, Google App Engine uh, is free to use to a certain degree. And it's a highly scalable, highly reliable system. Just keeps running. And I was quite surprised, actually, that it was so effective because, uh, lo and behold, here's my homework from the 28th of June last year. Still running.
still there on App Engine. If 10,000 users suddenly decide to use this as a little blog, notice I don't get very many marks for beautiful web page design, but the functionality is spot on. Uh, if 10,000 users suddenly decide to use this blog, Google App Engine will scale up everything that's needed to make sure they get decent response. This is a free service, remember, from Google. But what I wanted to point out here was notice Welcome Grader. This was the automatic grader coming into my blog, doing a blog post automatically. Notice it put in some random string for the title and some random content for the contents of the blog. And then it would, of course, see whether my blog worked as, as it should by stripping out these strings to see if it worked or not. And it would tell me, yes, I passed or not, as the case may be. So to be successful, I think you need this type of automated assessment to handle the numbers involved. So that was Udacity 253. I got a good high mark on that, I'm glad to say, as, as I should have done. If I didn't, I'd be in trouble. Uh, and I have a certificate of completion it's somewhere in my e-portfolio now. Another one I did just to see what, was, what happened, and uh, is Phil here, whoever teaches the introduction to programming. This is a good old Nick Palante from Stanford giving the you know, computer science 101 subject. Again, very much more traditional, although he did use the online... Uh, simulator, the, in this case for JavaScript, but his slides and his lectures were long and uh, you're not nearly as enjoyable to do as Steve Huffman. Uh, it was interesting to see what they covered and how far they got, which is actually quite a long way, and the sort of programming they taught students to do, uh, which was uh, all based around image processing, which of course is something that you could see instant results for. So it, there were a number of interesting features. I'm glad to say I got 100% on this course. There are various others that uh, I'll briefly mention later. This, though, is one of the significant courses, the Google MOOC, Power Searching with Google. Google's first MOOC. They now have a second one called Advanced Power Searching with Google. Um, again, a, a five-week course. Uh, I think uh, Peter actually did this. What, what do you think of it? Oh, I quite enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. And the feedback, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I learned some things I didn't know. Yes, well, so, so did I. But I'm pleased to say I got 100% on the final <laughs> assessment, which, which again, we should. Now, to provide this course, Google produced a MOOC platform, uh, you know, which obviously you need. You need to have a platform to present, you know, to take enrollments, to present the videos, to present the quizzes, to present the results, to present the assessment and the results. Uh, you need a, a web-based platform to do this, uh, and which I duly did. They've now open-sourced this and given it to the world. It's called the Google Course Builder. And of course, it's based on Google App Engine, as you would imagine, that's what they use internally. So that's now available to us all to do our own MOOCs, uh, courtesy of Google. And I'll show you my small effort later. I uh, mentioned my only humanities MOOC. Uh, I didn't get, all I got was a, 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 an email saying, thank you for completing the subject. Uh, so it wasn't really a proper certificate. And the, the guy at, at uh, Princeton, or Mitch, he, um, he took down all the, all the materials as soon as the course had finished, which I thought was, was a bit rude. Most MOOC, you know, once you've completed them, uh, what, you, what you did is still there. All the materials are still there for you to access for quite a long time after the course completes, but not so at Princeton. He obviously enjoyed doing it himself because he, he wrote uh, an article published, I think, in the New York Times. He appeared on TV. And he was, he was a good teacher, but very traditional in his approach. Didn't really adjust the MOOCs fully enough. Now, he's doing this again, and I, 
uh, I might just pop in and have a look at it to see if any improvements. I learned a lot about sociology, I have to say, and uh, uh, I, th I think I got useful knowledge out of the course. I didn't enjoy the conduct of the course, I have to say. These are just some of the other MOOCs I've started primarily and not necessarily completed. The one that I'm actually doing seriously at the moment is this one, Open Education, from uh, the Open University UK. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it is about what, op what is Open Education. MOOCs, of course, are part of this. Uh, it's, it's, it's a useful way of of interacting with the other students. There's a lot of other sort of retired people like myself and existing uh, lecturers uh, doing this as well as uh, new students. This is actually part of a master's program from the Open University in the UK and the actual master's students are doing this uh, as part of their, their study as well. Uh, the other one that's still currently running but I haven't really unfortunately had HTML5 game development, how to write uh, games with HTML5, which uh, is good stuff, but I just haven't had time to do the, the work and the assessments. And a lot of these notes are to do with e-learning and uh, essentially MOOCs as well. So I've probably been involved, at least to, to begin the courses, in about a dozen MOOCs over the last uh, 12 months. So that's MOOCs. How have the higher education institution, or all education institutions for that matter, to react? And as well as sort of the denial uh, articles that I call them, you know, we're different in, in traditional higher education. We don't have to worry about this. Yes, this can go on, but you know, we offer good, high-quality education we don't need to worry about so much about MOOCs. Apart from those, we're starting to see articles where, well, how could possibly MOOCs be integrated with existing higher education? And these are some of the ideas that have come up. Uh, obviously, there's collaboration between institutions for brand positioning, and we've seen that in edX, for example, as the prime example of that. There's that uh, open to study in Australia. Has Bond been approached? Has Bond approached any of these consortia? To anyone's knowledge? Should they? That's a question I, I throw open. One thing they're doing in Tasmania, which I thought was quite interesting, they said, well, yes, MOOCs are not really part of our undergraduate curriculum, but a lot of what we do in research, we could do MOOCs based around our research expertise, offer them for fr free to the local community, and uh, showing off our research and uh, maybe inviting some of the lo local community to be involved. And the, the, the primary example of this is the dementia research they're doing at the University of Taz. Uh, they've done a MOOC on that and uh, get community involved in that way. So, you know, th that's perhaps a benefit, but not a commercial benefit in any sense. Would you consider allowing MOOCs for credit? For entry into Bond, obviously that's a that's a possibility. I notice uh, traditional higher education is starting to be called residential education as opposed to online education. Uh, is it is it sensible? And then of course, when you get an applicant to Bond now, who walks up to the applications desk, the registrar and says, "Hey." What is Bond doing in the MOOC space? What's our answer? Wouldn't it be nice if we had a MOOC or two out there? If only for saying, yes, we, you know, we know about MOOCs, we've actually done some. Uh, you can go and watch them if you like. They might be useful. Uh, I, I just think just from that awareness perspective that there's benefits in doing a, a MOOC for someone uh, somewhere like Bond. Now, this is a, a little blog post I wrote a few months ago. I introduced the measurement of milli-degree, a one-thousandth of a degree. It turns out that if you look at the numbers in 24 subjects, 12 weeks, four contact hours a week, 
1152, I think it is. So roughly, one contact hour at Bond is a milli-degree, quite approximately. Therefore, one of our subjects is 42 of those. From my own experience, and again, this is just me, what I think, the MOOCs I've done vary in uh, content between about 15 and 35 milli-degrees. So some of them are almost as good as a whole subject. Like the very first one I did, that web apps engineering, I'd say was quite close to what I taught as a full subject at Bond. So, just following on this perhaps erroneous path, 40 to 50 MOOCs equivalent to one degree. What do we think of that? Nonsense. I just begin to wonder whether that sort of collection of MOOCs, what would happen if I went along to an employer and said, I've done 50 MOOCs, these are what they are. Will you employ me? What will the employer say? Again, probably not much at the moment. But could you imagine one day that would be regarded as an equivalent of some kind? I just throw that open. Of course, we're on to this micro-credentials idea. And believe it or not, the Mozilla Foundation, the, the guys who produce uh, Firefox, have for a while been working on this Open Badges project. And lo and behold, what was one of the first activities I had to do on this Open Education course last week was something about OERs, you know, Open Education Resources. I had to write a blog post about it. It's one of the activities. And I got awarded a badge. I've been awarded the OER Understanding Badge. <laughs> Notice I, I acquired this just this week on Tuesday. Notice that was the criteria, and this was my evidence, i.e. my blog post. Quite an interesting idea, don't you think? Nothing to do with degrees, but badges. This is the philosophy behind the Open Badge project. Leave it to you to decide whether you believe in any of this, but notice you get your badges in a variety of ways. You have your badge backpack. I now have a badge back backpack with one badge in it. And I can actually provide links to that on, on the web in a variety of ways, just to show that I got this badge. And notice they're saying, oh yes, that's going to help you get a job give you extra educational opportunities, etc. Now this is just one of many such schemes, that, well, I say many, uh, one of a handful of schemes I've come across. I suspect this is going to become more prevalent. Again, if, if a student applies to Bond and says, I got one of these badges, what, what would our response be? Just ignore it? Do we give it any credence? Etc. This is the sort of question we're going to be faced with. Now then, I've convinced you you want to do your own MOOC. Well, I guess you could use iLearn, Blackboard. A bit difficult because, of course, to use Blackboard, you have to have a local bond login. I'm not sure how far we've got on uh, allowing, giving logins away to other people outside of bond. Oh, have they? Yeah. Oh, have they? What, what's it called? Course sites. Course sites. Okay, I haven't heard of that. Uh, okay, so yes, you could use that. But the ones I've looked at, Pathright seems to me to be a, a, a useful platform. It allows you to charge for your MOOC should you want to, but uh, you can put them up for free. And you use it as an instructor for free. Udemy is the, probably the prime paid for MOOC sites and it's not really MOOC in the way I've been describing it's more it, it, it's more used for craft skills or, or even um, you know, uh, to be, tech, some technological skills as well uh, but that's heavily based on a charging model so you pay money for this and of course there are stories of people earning hundreds of thousands a year providing courses via Udemy edX the consortium that I mentioned for, for providing MOOCs also is very soon to open source its platform. And so edX will 
will be available for us to use. And class to go out of Stanford, used for that the Stanford effort, has now just announced, uh, thanks Louise for telling me about this, uh, just announced they will merge with edX and provide the input into that. And so edX now will be the, I think one of the prime platforms. As I say, I use Course Builder from Google, completely free. And this is one that struck my eye recently. The highly skilled engineers used to work for um, Nokia in Finland that are being laid off in large numbers <laughs> have got together to form, I don't know how you pronounce that, Ely Adami, or Ely Ad Adami, yes, uh, a MOOC platform. Uh, basically, you can go and provide your own MOOC on that. Uh, so these are starting to appear. And so I've sort of achieved my long-term goal. I can now sit down and start to create a MOOC, sitting in my study at home, uh, and run it from there. And just to show you how far I've got, which is not very far, this is my first MOOC built on the Google Course Builder platform, the Cloud and You, CIS 101. I Cloud Aid Solutions is my sort of consultancy concept that I, that I have. And I've become a cloud architect now. Uh, but this is going to be a free MOOC about you know, what is the cloud, how can you use it. I had hoped to have it a bit further along than this and actually have some, a schedule and some units in place, but I haven't got that far, so to say. All I've done is made the introductory video, which you can go ahead and play if, if you like. Notice this is on AppSpot. This is up and running for free. Google supporting this. If I get 160,000 people on my MOOC, this platform will support it perfectly. It'll automatically scale up to support large numbers of users for me. Of course, if I exceed a certain limit, I'll have to start paying Google something for that. But uh, for you know a few thousand users, it would work. So that brings us on to the MOOC business model, if is the one. But so far, I remember, it's free. MOOCs are free. How on earth do you make money? Well, we've talked about some of the ways you might use MOOCs to benefit your higher education institution, but they're not exactly money spinners. This is an idea from a couple of months ago. Jim Barber, VC of UNE, he says to, for institutions I suspect like his to survive in the world of he, 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 he declines to call them MOOCs, notice he insists on just calling them MOOCs uh, but he's saying that you know, this represents a, a major risk we've got to innovate and we need a business model I think as Dirk was saying just the other day if you were here at Bond or any similar institution and you said to your students go off and do that MOOC and then we'll discuss it in class. What would be their reaction? They wouldn't think much and say, why am I paying you know, my full, full whack? Uh, and I've been going off to do a free MOOC. Yes, I might get some good feedback from you as a lecturer, but I'm not going to pay you my full fee for that. So we can't do that. But what can we do? Well, Jim Barber, he suggests, of course, we offer accredited exams. They could pay for that. We could offer moderated discussion groups. They could pay for that. We could offer high-quality tutorial assistance, something they don't get in a MOOC, of course, because it's, it's all forums and peer assistance. That's where Jim Barber thinks we could earn some money. But notice that's not equivalent to a full, whatever we charge now, it must be close to $4,000 a subject. It's not $4,000 worth there, but it is maybe $1,000 worth. At least there's some money in that. So that's one possible business model. What others are there? Well, if we're going to sort of push back the MOOC invasion, we're going to have to come up with other business models. This is just one idea which I thought was worth putting forward and it's being thought of you know, at a high level in Australia. 
So the mukhak, but as far as I, I see it, a lot of it is saying, well, until a university accepts a MOOC as a credit, you know, credit, uh, MOOCs are not going to work. I don't think that's a valid argument. The key people involved here are the industry employers. Will they accept a bunch of MOOCs as useful experience on which they would consider employing you? That, I think, is the acid test. So, in a sense, it's what these will run in parallel with degrees. In fact, what may happen is you will have aspects of both uh, for, the, for the time being. So, it's industry acceptance that's the key, not higher education acceptance. What is the business case? I've just talked about that in, in brief. Should MOOCs, in fact, charge money, and how much would you pay as a as a student of a MOOC, would you think is a sensible amount? And they wouldn't then be MOOCs, of course. It would be an evolution of MOOCs of some kind. I do believe MOOCs offer effective learning opportunities. It does, however, rely on you being careful with your time and effort. The big problem, of course, is was it you who actually did the assessment? Or was it some mate you got in to answer the questions for you? And, of course, this is being addressed in a number of ways, but proctored exams are now being offered by third parties or some institutions themselves. So they have you into the room so they know who you are. Uh, you do the assessment online in their presence. And so they say, yep, this is actually Jim Bloggs who did this. And who knows then if a MOOC certificate might be more set. They're certainly very useful at the moment for upskilling uh, while you're still working in a job uh, or doing a career. You know, now, 300 odd MOOCs around the world, all of them offer you something. So, I think they do offer effective learning, even its old fashioned online course technology. There's still some benefit in that. And then we're faced with this economic imperative. I'm taking this from the Avalanche is Coming that uh, was published just last month from the UK, from the Institute of Public Policy Research. Fees going up, the benefit of having a degree dropping, although by, not by a lot. How are we fighting this? Well, MOOCs are coming in, and are, I suspect they're being a or will be a competitor fairly soon, if not already. So that has to be considered. And if, you, if the uh, lecturers here or to go away with just one thought in their mind, think four-minute lectures. And if you want those references I talked about, here's the link. But it's also via the talks link as well. So thank you for your time.